From the outside looking in, and hell, even a little bit from the inside, JoJo's bizarre adventure only seems to be about a few things. Convoluted superpowers, insane muscle poses, and Italian food. But after my experience with the series and becoming a big fan of it, I can say that the biggest consistent theme of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is sacrifice. Death and sacrifice isn't unfamiliar in the shonen genre, but because JoJo shifts its main cast in every part, mangaka Hirohiko Araki rarely felt the need to pull his punches with character death. No Dragon Balls or Magic Tears are here to bring the cast of Jojo back from the dead, and I think that's something Araki may have intended when he opted for his part-by-part -part format, to show one era and cast saving the day and giving all they have to make room for another. Almost every part of Jojo shows some form of sacrifice towards its end. This brings us to Part 5, the segment of the Jojo saga with the most sacrifice and the most emphasis on the matter. After the final battle of Jojo Part 5, we're treated to a flashback, an encounter that takes place before Giarno even enters the scene, in which Guido Mista comes face to face with the enigmatic Scalipi and his stand, Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone is, aptly enough, a massive stone that when chiseled away at, unveils the shape of somebody prophesized to die. Only by breaking the stone as a whole can one change this fortune, in turn causing the stone to reshape into new victims of its prophecy, but with no promise that the outcome would necessarily be better or worse. Mista breaks the stone and leaves the scene without looking to see that the stone has now taken the shape of Narantia and Abakio, simply in addition to Bruno, effectively dooming the three members of Bruno's team who do indeed die over the course of Part 5. Scalipi, being a sculptor, comments on his mantra that we, as human beings, are all simply slaves in the stone. A sculpture within a stone is predetermined before the chisel hits it. All an artist does is reveal this, just as we, as followers of our fate, have no control over our final destinies, only the steps that lead up to it. Hearing this mentality from Scolipi, I could only think of the Zeppeli family characters from Parts 1 and 2, and their curse to sacrifice themselves to keep their friends alive and save the world. Caesar Zeppeli comments on this himself, being one to bear the Zeppeli name, and forced to die for Joseph's sake, just as his father died for his own sake and his grandfather died for Jonathan. I don't think it was unintentional that the Zeppeli family is of Italian origin, and that they would share this mentality with the characteristically Italian cast of Part 5, because I think Part 5 as a whole is sort of encompassing and an emblem of Araki's views on sacrifice and fate. The first half of Part 5 focuses on Bruno and the gang's mission to deliver Trish to her father, the boss of Passione, all while dodging and fighting La Squadra, who seek to kidnap Trish for themselves to go against the boss on their own terms. However, Bruno sees enough himself when delivering Trish that the boss's intentions with her are wicked. It is then and there that he decides to defy the boss, taking Trish from him on his own and declaring himself traitor to his superior in the name of his own morals and nobility. He declares that the rest of his gang is in no way required to join him on what is essentially a suicide mission to stand against Diavolo and his seemingly unstoppable stand but all of his gang, sans Fugo, stand by him. Things go... marginally disastrously from there. Before Bruno can even succumb to his wounds, Diavolo manages to kill both Abakio and Narancia, albeit all in circumstances that involve them dying to keep the rest of their team moving forward. Because of their respective sacrifices, Giorno, Mista, and Trish all manage to vanquish Diavolo once and for all, protecting Trish from her father who sought to end her life, and allowing Giorno to end the corrupt drug trade he so long wished to as the new leader of Passione. With so much death being the cost of these victories, one could be led to wonder if it was even worth it. But Bruno would have never died if he hadn't stood up to Diavolo. Abakio's death allowed Giorno to distinguish Diavolo's fingerprints, and Narancia dying in Giorno's place allowed Giorno to live to defeat Diavolo one-on-one. -on -one. Rolling Stone showed that all three were destined to die, but all three equally proved that none of it would be in vain. 
Just like the Zeppelis before them, they all died in manners necessary to the greater good, to save not only Trish, but the countless youth that Giorno was horrified to see fall victim to Passione's drug trade. Within the stone that Mista exposed, they were all to die. But because of Giorno's dream and Bruno's courage, they all spent their last remnants of life in meaning and nobility. Bento Awero is notably more brutal than prior JoJo parts, in that most stand encounters end in death rather than a mere slap on the wrist as occurred before. This can be chalked up to the gang war backdrop, serving an overall more harsh reality, but I think it's also because overall, the story is served by death. Even the early rogues of the series, La Squadra, seem like bodies in a crossfire. They hate the boss as much as Giorno does and as much as Bruno grows to, making some wonder why they never put their differences aside and took on Diavolo together, despite being, indeed, more insidious than their counterparts in Bruno's team, they, more or less, die because of misunderstanding. The stand users of La Squadra were, in certain waves, slaves to their own stone, fated to die, and do so as the villains because they resorted to extortion and kidnapping, rather than Team Bucciarti's more virtuous means. La Squadra had the same goal as Giorno and the heroes, but because they were motivated by greed and spite, and proved to be bullies and scoundrels, their fate was only to be stepping stones to bring the heroes closer to their encounter with the boss. Following the law set by Araki and how he treats the cast of Part 5, fate is predetermined, but how we get there is not. Giorno decided to pursue his place as the leader of Passione on his own, and change the path of those around him, but as Rolling Stone's prophecy proved, not their final fate. The destination may have been final, but the path along the way changed the lives of many for the better. We're all slaves in the stone but we have a number of decisions, twists, and turns leading up to it. With the gift of life, we can't defy when our story ends, but we have the utmost control over what we achieve with our numbered days up until that point.